okay. Can someone quote John 11.35 for me? Jesus left. <coughs> Good job. Now, um, we're going to get our PowerPoint up, and we're going to do a little bit of review on things we covered last time. God made a promise in His Word, and that promise was that His Word would remain forever. And when we're talking about the copying and recopying of God's Word, that's how God kept His promise. Last time we talked about the three languages that the Bible was originally written in, which were what, Brother Wayne? Sorry, what? The three languages that the Bible was originally written in. Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. There you go. That was an easy one, wasn't it? Okay. What is the word manuscript? What does manuscript mean, Brother David Darson? Written by hand. Written by hand, correct. All right, so all of the early copies of the Bible were written by hand. This is the most ancient form of writing we know about, dating back from about the time of Abraham, called cuneiform script. And uh, this is uh, what you find in a lot of the clay tablets that have been unearthed in that uh, near the uh, first part of the second millennium B.C. Uh, most of the Old Testament was written on parchment scrolls. Brother K.J., what does that mean? Parchment? Yep. Uh, it's a type of uh, animal skin, usually from the, a baby unborn cow or a pig. Or that is correct. That is correct. And remember that the, the Greek word for that is membrana, which helps you remember its skin. This is another type of writing that some of the early New Testament manuscripts were written on writing material. What's this stuff that this person's messing with there, Brother Jess? Papyrus. That is papyrus. <laughs> and is it skin or not? No, it's pith of a, a certain plant. That's right. It comes from a plant. And uh, by a process of the horizontal and vertical strips and pressing them down and drying them, you come up with papyrus, very popular in ancient times, especially in Egypt and in some other places as well. This is the oldest fragment of uh, the New Testament. What is it a fragment of, Brother Rocha? The John Ryland papyrus. Yeah, I know it's the John Rowley Papyrus, but what piece of the New Testament is this a fragment of? John 18? Yes, it is. What a bean. New Rock City. So, um, this is a piece of probably one of the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is written on parchment, not papyrus. You can see that its skin is Hebrew. This is actually Paleo-Hebrew, old-style Hebrew, which shows me this is not a Masoretic manuscript, but an earlier manuscript like one of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, we talked about the scrolls, how you open them, how you have to take care of them, how fragmentary many of them are. Uh, this dude is a scribe, and he's got a roll of papyrus probably in his hand and a stylus. We talked about how scribes did their thing with their dictation. These are all what kind of scribes in these pictures right here? Egyptian, Egyptian scribes, that is correct. And uh, these go back a long ways. Of course, the scribes that we're concerned about were Hebrew scribes with the Old Testament, but we don't have a lot of pictures or stone cuts of those kind of guys. These were their cousins in other languages or other lands, the Egyptians. These are probably Syrians. What do we call a group of scribes all taking dictation at the same time? What's the word for that? A scriptorium. That's right. And we talked about the little kits that the scribes had and how they had a stylus or reed pen and they had the little ink palettes. These are some Syrian scribes. Notice their facial features and 
racial features different than the Egyptians. Very interesting when you look at these old uh, stone cuts and, and archaeological stuff. You can tell kind of which nationalities of people are being depicted in those. Even the way they dress is more distinctive. It's, you can tell by the way they dress by lots of different things. This is a bunch of Egyptian scribes. They've got their uh, styli in their hair, their uh, palettes and their ink palettes out to the side, and they're, uh, you know, they're taking dictation in the scriptorium. This is the little scribal kit that you find described in, in Ezekiel chapter 9, where it says there was a man dressed in linen with a writer's kit at his side. And that's what we're talking about right here. The little water jar and the little ink palette and the little hypodermic shapes, reed, pen. This was what most scribes wrote with on their um, ink palettes. For many, many years, the text of the Old Testament was largely based on Masoretic manuscripts like this one. What do we mean when we say a Masoretic manuscript? Brother Nathan McVeigh, nice and loudly, please. scribe uh, based on their tradition. Expand on that a little bit, Brother uh, Warns. Uh, I believe it was a number system that calculated how many words were used in that ma particular manuscript and uh, kept records. Yeah. All right, so what do we call that tradition? of statistics about how many words and phrases and so forth occurred in different books of the Bible. What do we call the particular tradition, Brother Jason Hyde? The uh, Sofer. The what? The Sofer? No, that's that's the scribe. Is it the Masora? Masora. Masora is the tradition. That's why these guys were called Masoretes, because they followed that scribal tradition in copying and recopying uh, these manuscripts. Uh, these manuscripts are <coughs> manuscripts, uh, not early ones. Uh, this is Br British Museum Oriental A. Open at the book of Exodus at the Ten Commandments. This is another one that's from that time period we talked about. These manuscripts, this is a fragment of the Cairo Geniza fragments, which uh, Solomon Schechter found in the Benezra Synagogue in 1898 in that uh, back room where they chunked all their manuscripts. The Masoretic scribes were medieval scribes who copied the text based on an inherited scribal tradition called the Masora. The Masora was a long-standing tradition of the Jewish scribes involved the passing down of a check and balance system which ensured the accuracy of the copying of the text. The word for scribe is sofer, which means a counter, a counter, because he was always counting the words and phrases and letters to make sure that he had an accurate copy when he was making the copy. I'll ask you about those words. This is the word for scribe, so fair is how you pronounce it. And it would be the word that Hebrew word that means counting. <coughs> Ezra was one of these guys. That's those that rabbis teaching those boys about their scribal tradition. That's that rabbi beating that little boy and telling him to do it right. See? Y'all think you've got it hard. Those guys got beat and they had to do their thing. We talked about the medieval manuscripts that have the Masora built into the artwork and into the margins. We looked at different pictures of those manuscripts, like this one up at the top in the margins. You've got the Masora written. This is probably the best copy of the Old Testament Hebrew Bible that we have, the Leningrad Codex, dating from A.D. 1008. And it's... Uh, pretty much the standard text of the Hebrew Bible. The Aleppo Codex. Aleppo Codex. 
This is the front piece of a book there. There's some more of the artwork where the Hebrew words in the, that make up the bodies of the dogs and the designs are the statistics of the Masora. So they not only copied the manuscripts, is the point, but in the margins of the manuscripts and in the artwork, they transmitted the Masora, the statistics that guaranteed the accuracy of uh, the manuscripts. Uh, all of these are Masoretic manuscripts. Now, here's the list that I want to make sure you have of the Masoretic manuscripts that are the primary best ones, most of the evidence that we have. There's the British Museum Oriental, which is a copy of the Pentateuch dating from 850 A.D. Then you've got Codex Cairoensis from Cairo. It's the former and latter prophets dating from 916 A.D. Then you have the Leningrad Manuscript B. It's the one we showed earlier dating from 1008. Uh, this is the entire Old Testament, see? And that's, that's what makes it so valuable. Then you've got Aleppo Codex. That's a partial copy of the Old Testament. Missing some, some fragments, some sections. It's dated about 930. Then you've got the Ruthland copy of Prophets, dated 9, 1105. And then you've got Skechter's 24,000 pieces of old Bibles discovered in 1890 at the Cairo Synagogue of Ben Ezra, Ben Ezra Synagogue in Cairo. It's called the Cairo Geniza Fragments. What's a Geniza, Brother Dan Kell? Peel? Uh, that is the uh, holy trash can. <laughs> that is exactly right. It's the holy trash can, the back room where they chunk all the old Bibles. That is true. <laughs> okay it means a hiding place this is Skechter studying all those fragments of old Bibles and Hebrew from the medieval period this is the holy trash can's entrance in the balcony of the Ben Ezra synagogue in Cairo and they're taking out all those pieces of trash which are actually pages out of old Bibles Hebrew Bibles from centuries gone by There's him with his research project in hand. Now, how would you like to have to wade through all of that in Hebrew and collate and catalog and all that kind of stuff? Now, this is one example of the type of manuscript that we're talking about, and you can see from the straight Hebrew columns that it's very much like the Leningrad manuscript or some of these others that we've found. Uh, so the, the same type of thing that we had had already had in the Masoretic text, these are Masoretic manuscripts from the medieval period, similar in date to the, to the other great ones. Just giving you some examples of how they look with their Masora in the margins and the footnote, etc. These are the, the character of the Hebrew manuscripts we had up until 1947. Some of them are very beautiful and ornate, and some of them are plain Jane. Then you remember in 1947 at Qumran, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Dead Sea Library was discovered in the, how many caves, uh, Brother Jeremy? Uh, I'm going to take a shot in the dark because my notes haven't opened, but I'm going to say 11. Yes, that's a good shot. 11. And... Uh, those Dead Sea Scrolls, of course, were found in 1947 at Qumran. They were the library of a Jewish monastic community of Essenes that had been stuffed in those 11 caves when everybody left in front of the Roman armies in A.D. 68 and bugged out of town. See? But they preserved their library in those big clay jars there. The manuscripts at Qumran date between 250 B.C. and A.D. 68. So the manuscripts at Qumran date a thousand years earlier, basically, than the manuscripts that we had before 1947. And that's why they're so important in studying the history of the text. We talked about the Qumran community. 
the Essene Jews that, that uh, withdrew there, and, and there's, it's very interesting to study some of their community documents. Uh, those are the caves again. That's the jars. That's the type of Hebrew manuscripts we're dealing with. Many of them are very fragmentary, like that. <laughs> it may be a piece of the book of Daniel or a piece of the book of Nahum or a piece of the book of Malachi or something. And they've got jillions of those to unravel and to catalog and etc. The jars. Yes, Brother Dan Keel. Did you did you say that they went from two fifty to the other day to, to one thousand AD or did you say sixty eight today? Sixty eight AD. Sixty eight is the date when they left, see, the community and shut it down. They said, here comes the Roman army. We're going to get crushed. We've got to get out of Dodge. Let's dump the library and go. And so that's what they did in A.D. 68. Okay. It's about the same time period you see in the movie Masada. It's about the same time period when Masada was being besieged and taken down and the Romans were coming through Palestine. Same sort of thing. Okay, thank you. This is uh, one of those manuscripts gives you, it's a pretty full manuscript. I like it because it shows the lines of Hebrew. It shows the uh, seam where the, the parchment was sewed together. The sheets of parchment were sewed together there. Good picture. This is a, one of the caves at Qumran. This is cave number 11. Some people rooting around in there looking at the cave. Of course, all the manuscripts have been removed. We had this uh, example of one cave, cave four. And uh, like, for example, see those 18 manuscripts of Deuteronomy that were found in this one cave? The first one would be called uh, 4 q Dute a And the second one would be called 4 q Dute b And the third one would be called 4 q Dute c Okay. And if you were talking about the manuscripts of Samuel, the three manuscripts of Samuel, they would be 4Q Sam A, 4Q Sam B, and 4Q Sam C. Are you with me? So the 4 means K4, the Q means Qumran, the Sam means Samuel, and ABC is the, the catalog letter of the manuscript, however many manuscripts that there were. So I'll ask you, I'll give you one of those to decipher maybe on the test. There's another example of the Qumran scrolls, the Dead Sea Scrolls, very different in their character, very different in their appearance, very different in their, uh, the way they look. You know, they've got these wide columns, Paleo-Hebrew. They're very different looking than the later Masoretic very professional looking manuscripts that we saw earlier. But the Isaiah scroll, very famous. This is actually 1Q Isaiah A, which is different than some of the other Isaiah manuscripts in that it's complete. It's an actual complete copy with, with no missing parts of the book of Isaiah. Uh, this was the one that got so much publication because they found it to be so uncannily uh, accurate to the Masoretic uh, uh, manuscripts of Isaiah. And one of the reasons why scholars have great confidence in the in the transmission tradition of the Masora. So that our book of Isaiah, see, and our book of other scriptures are based on not only the Masoretic text, but also the Dead Sea Scrolls and uh, other uh, ancient versions of Isaiah, like the Septuagint version, uh, when I speak of the Septuagint version, I'm talking about some manuscripts that may go back to the 1st century or the 2nd century or the 3rd century A.D., still very old compared to the Masoretic text of the Old Testament the Greek translation of the book of Isaiah. So there's a lot of physical evidence that um, is uh, involved in the text of the Old Testament. There are also versions of the Old Testament. What's a version? Brother Jack Dodgen? A uh, translation of the original text into a different language. That's right. 
So would it be correct to speak of the Hebrew version of the Old Testament? No. That's because the Hebrew is the original language, isn't it? But it would be correct to speak of the Syriac version, like you've got on the left there, or the Greek version of the Old Testament, which is the Septuagint, see? So those are different versions of the Old Testament, not the only ones. Uh, we call these secondary witnesses to the Old Testament text. See, the primary evidence is the Hebrew and Aramaic. See, that's the original language. Secondary witnesses would be the translations into other languages, like the Greek translation on your right, the Syriac translation, etc. So you've got the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And you've got the... Um, Aramaic targums, Aramaic paraphrases of the Old Testament. Uh, then you've got the Latin Vulgate, which is the secondary witness, a version of the Old Testament. See, back in Roman times, uh, there were lots of translations of the Old Testament into Latin, Old Latin and the Latin Vulgate. So Latin is one of the versions of the Old Testament. So you had Greek, Latin, Aramaic, Targums, and then you have the Syriac version, which is pictured there on your on your left. Those are secondary witnesses to the Old Testament. So we've got all these Hebrew manuscripts, Dead Sea Scrolls, Cairo Geniza fragments, Masoretic manuscripts. Then we've got all these versions, these old manuscripts of Greek translations and Aramaic Targums and Latin Vulgate and Syriac that we can compare, and that helps us also refine the, the text and the readings uh, of the Old Testament. So this is all physical, empirical evidence that we have for the text of the Old Testament uh, that helps us know that we have an accurate Old Testament. Our biggest trust factor is in, the, uh, in two things. Number one, the confirmatory evidence of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Number two, the scribal tradition called the Masora, which guaranteed the accurate transmission of the Bible text to a large degree. Those are kind of the two things that if skeptics were saying, well, how can we know that we have an accurate Old Testament? Those are kind of the two things that we would hang our hat on. And we would show that this is all the manuscript evidence that, that we have. So there is a lot of evidence that suggests that we really do have an accurate Old Testament, plus there's God's promise that the word of the Lord abides forever. So you have your faith in that promise, and then you have all this evidence that seems to back up that, that, that faith. Okay, does anybody want to ask anything about this, what we've covered so far on the Old Testament text and the evidence for the Old Testament text? If somebody were to ask you, what what three major sources of manuscript evidence are there for the Old Testament text? What would you say, Brother Anthony? Can you repeat the question one more time? The three major evidence for the Old three, Testament? Three major categories of manuscript evidence for the Old Testament text. So you're talking about the uh, secondary witnesses of the, uh, the versions that we have. We have the Nazareth tradition, scribal tradition, and we have the Dead Sea Scrolls to verify the accuracy. Okay, you're getting pretty close. The, the, when you're actually talking about physical evidence, manuscripts, you have the Masoretic manuscripts. And what time period do they come from? From 600 to 1500 A.D.? Yeah, they're, they're late medieval stuff. Then you've got the Dead Sea Scrolls. What time period do they come from? From uh, 200 B.C. to 368 A.D.? That's pretty close. And then you have the Cairo Geniza fragments. And what time period do they come from? I have no idea. Somebody else? They were like, uh, like in the 
the sixth, the sixth or the ninth century? Yeah, or later on, even than that. They're the same time period as the Masoretic manuscripts. So the tenth uh, to the twelfth. Yeah, that one of the manuscripts we saw dated in that, but the, the Cairo Geniza fragments are actually just a whole bunch of fragments of Masoretic manuscripts, but they're usually looked at as a separate class because they were found in a different place. So you've got you've got, and I'll form the question better, but you have the the uh, Masoretic manuscripts from the late medieval years including the 24,000 fragments of the Cairo Geniza fragments. Then you have the Dead Sea Scrolls, see? And then you have the secondary witnesses, the versional evidence, including the Greek translation, the Syriac translation, the Aramaic Targums, and the Latin version. See, those are the physical evidences you have for the Old Testament text. Okay. Um... The story of the text of the New Testament is a different story. Uh, one reason it's a different story is because don't have any Masora. They don't have anything like that. Uh, the Old Testament, at least in the history of the text that we know about, was copied by a group of scribes that were from the very beginning very seriously trained and very seriously motivated to transmit the text in a very meticulous way. The New Testament text, at least for the first several hundred years, was pretty much copied by every Tom, Dick, and Harry that uh, wanted a copy. In other words, like this picture of you guys, for example. If you guys were Christians and y'all were wearing like togas or something in the first century and, and you were, you know, some of you were slaves and some of you were Roman citizens and some of, few of you were Goths and, you know, a couple of Visigoths hanging out there with little horns on their helmets or whatever and, and uh, you guys had become Christians. And you guys had come to really respect the teachings of the Apostle Paul or the Apostle Peter or whatever. And uh, your little congregation wanted copies of those things. And somebody would say, you know, Brother, Brother Wayne, why don't you sit down and make us a copy of that letter from Paul? And he'd go, well, okay, but, you know, I might have to do it. You know, in the mornings early, before I have to go to work for my master, uh, Tibius uh, Respectus over here, you know, and I might have to do it while I'm drinking my coffee, and so you would do your coffee. And you, uh, well, who is, who is Brother Wayne? Why, well, he's just some guy that works in the leather tannery over here. He's a slave of Tibius Maximus over here. Well, what's he doing making a copy? Well, he... he respects the letters of Paul and the church needs a copy and so he said he'd do it. Okay. What's he doing it on? Well, he's got a he's got an old uh, piece of leather over there that they're not using and he's just going to do it on that. See? Well, I'm, I'm really not being too much of an exaggeration here because pretty much whoever copied down the first copies of the New Testament and transmitted them. Now, I don't have any doubt that they tried to be careful and all that kind of stuff. But there was not any professionalism, per se, that was at work in the majority of the earliest copies. It was just done because the people wanted a copy of those authoritative apostolic letters. I'm sure they did a good job. They did the best they could. But there's no standardization to it of any kind. Uh, this uh, picture is a person in the chair. Uh, the chair, the cathedra in the early church, uh, was a teaching chair. And uh, Jesus mentioned this chair in um, Matthew 23. If you turn over there for just a minute, Matthew 23. He was talking about in the synagogues. But the cathedra, the chair, was a tradition of, of teaching. Matthew chapter 23. Did you spell that word cathedra? 
C-A-T-H-E-D-R-A. C-A-T-H-E-D-R-A. What word does that sound a whole lot like? Cathedral. Yeah. And cathedrals were the places where the cathedra sat, the teaching chair. See, that's that just meant the building where the teaching chair is. And the person that uh, sat in the teaching chair was oftentimes the elder or the bishop that sat in the teaching chair. But look at uh, verse 2, 23-2. Jesus says to uh, his disciples, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' cathedra. So you must obey them and do everything they tell you. In other words, they're your teachers. They're teaching you the law. They're teaching you God's word. So this picture is a guy, some guy, sitting in the cathedra teaching. And he would take a manuscript of the Bible and he would teach. And he probably made a copy to teach from, you know. And this happened everywhere, in, in the wherever the Christians met, whether they met in somebody's den or whether they met wherever, you know. Uh, it was a sort of an informal type thing. Well, we're going to talk about the copies, but for our purposes here, so we get kind of a summary. The text of the New Testament is based on the following things. You see the little picture there of the modern printed Greek New Testament. That's like my old Greek New Testament I've got here. What is it based on? And there are several categories of evidence that it's based on. We'll just number these and we'll just go right down through here. So we have, first of all, it's based on the late minuscules. We're going to talk about what that means. But those are late medieval manuscripts of the Greek New Testament in a cursive handwriting style. Late minuscules. There's bukus of those manuscripts. The late minuscule manuscripts. Uh, it's also based on lectionaries. Lectionaries are Bible manuscripts, most of them late in date, that are uh, some of them fairly early too. But lectionaries are pieces of the New Testament, portions of the New Testament, arranged by Sundays, 52 weeks of the year. This is your scripture reading for this Sunday. This is your scripture reading for next Sunday. So there are manuscripts of portions of the New Testament that were arranged for reading on Sundays. They're not strictly in contextual order a lot of times, but they are lectionaries, meaning they were manuscripts read in church because this section of scripture is traditionally read on the first Sunday and the second Sunday and the third Sunday, like that. So that's what lectionaries are. They're Greek manuscripts. Of course, the New Testament that were read on various Sundays in the church. Then, uh, oldest are the parchment and papyrus unsealed manuscripts. Now, we're going to talk about these in detail, but those parchment and papyrus unsealed were printed Greek manuscripts as opposed to cursive. You know, when you were in the first grade, you learned to write printed letters, like your individual A and your individual B and your individual C. When you got second or third grade or whenever it was, you learned to write in cursive. Well, these manuscripts are in print Greek letters, uh, not cursive. It's called unseal script, and they're much older. And these are the manuscripts I'm talking about that were done, many of them were done during the time when Christianity was illegal, when Christians were persecuted, they're not professionally done. They are the copies that ancient Christians made before Christianity was legal. Many of them are, okay? So that's the parchment of papyrus unsealed. Then, out to the left-hand side, your fourth category of uh, evidence for the Greek Testament is uh, early versions of the New Testament. And there you have different translations of the Greek New Testament into other languages. 
and we'll get, we'll deal with those in detail. But you've got like your uh, Coptic version and your Old Latin version and your Latin Vulgate and your Armenian version and your Syriac various Syriac versions and all kinds of different versions or translations. And we've got thousands and thousands of manuscripts of those early translations of the New Testament. And then, finally, number five, you've got over on the right-hand side, the fathers, the church fathers. You've got the writings in Greek and Latin of the early church fathers. And the quotations, see, when the early church fathers quoted scripture, see, especially if they were Greek fathers and they were quoting it in Greek when it was originally written in Greek, then you've got some really good manuscript evidence there for various portions and parts of the New Testament. In fact, with the exception of just a handful of verses, you could entirely reconstruct the text of the New Testament just from the quotations of the church fathers. If you didn't even have any manuscripts other than that. You could virtually reconstruct the entire New Testament by just the quotations that we have from the church fathers. So as you have your, uh, what's that course that I started out and designed and they're still teaching there? Language and research, is that what they still call it? Okay, well in that course, hopefully, they're teaching you um, about... Uh, the Antonicene Fathers, Apostolic Fathers, and the Nicene and Post-Nicene Fathers, and how to do research in all of those. But that's the Fathers that I'm talking about here. Okay? So, uh, anyway, that is the scientific evidence in the various categories upon which our modern printed Greek New Testament uh, rests. Now, look at, again at the title in the black box there in the book. Modern printed Greek New Testament. When it says printed, that's to differentiate that from what kind of thing? Manuscripts. Manuscripts. See, the manuscripts are all those things underneath it. Printed means this comes out of a printing press. It's a matter of scientific collation of all of the information in all these manuscripts. Then we print it up. See, like we have in our modern printed Greek New Testament on a laser printer or a printing press or whatever they use for those kinds of things these days. All right, so the oldest kind of manuscript evidence that we have for uh, the text of the New Testament is what we call papyrus unsealed. Papyrus because the writing material is papyrus. Unsealed because it is this printed capital letter stuff uh, as opposed to cursive Greek writing. Now, like we were telling Dustin Campbell last week, we must have hurt his feelings because he didn't come back today, but uh, we were telling him that uh, uh, this uh, style of writing in these manuscripts went through an evolution. And that based on this style of writing and the way they made the various letters, you can pretty well date uh, the various manuscripts. It's not carbon-14 dating or something like that. It's based on paleography. And it's a pretty accurate way of, of doing things. Uh, this is the very end of the Gospel of Luke that you see right here. And it's interesting for a number of reasons. I want you to turn your Bibles to... Um, Actually, it's the very end of Luke and the very beginning of John. But you can see where the two divide there. Turn your Bibles to Luke 24, the very last part. Luke 24, the very last part. Now, if you see underneath the top paragraph there on the manuscript, look at the screen there. See, underneath the top paragraph, you have three words in the center. The first word is euangelion. And the second word there in the center is kata. 
And the third word is leukon. So in the center there, under that top paragraph, it says euangelion kata leukon, which means the gospel according to Luke. Okay? Now, if you look at that last line, that's where it's going to get interesting, the last line in the paragraph. I want you to read, how many versions do we have in that uh, in that classroom there? Who's got a New American Standard? Every every single one of you? Or, okay. Oh, boy. Y'all are just like a cult or something. Okay. <laughs> uh, I've, got a, I've got a King James Version. <clears throat> you rock city, Brother Steve. All right. Brother Steve, would you read the King James for us, please, sir? And go ahead. Yeah, go ahead and turn to it. Somebody else on your computer... Uh, look up, say, a Revised Standard Version or a um, some other version besides the um, New American Standard. What verse do you want me to read? Uh, the very last verse of Luke chapter 24. And we're continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. <laughs> All right, amen, brother. Now, let's go to um, the New American Standard Version. And let's have uh, Brother uh, Warren's there next to him read that New American Standard version. And we're continually in the temple praising God. No, no, no. Now, now, Steve, what's the difference in yours and his? Oh, the classroom agreed with what I said. They, they said amen. <laughs> yeah, but, but look more closely. What's the difference in the two? Uh... Read yours again and let him read his again. Okay, and we're continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. All right, now read, look at, look at, listen to Warren's, read his again. And we're continually in the temple praising God. So what is the actual technical difference in the two? And blessing. And blessing and then the amen. Uh, All right. right. Very good. So, so you you don't have the words and the blessing. You just have phrasing. Okay. Right. Now, does anybody have a different version looked up on your computadora? Okay, Jack Dodgson, you brother, go. What you got? And we're continually in the temple blessing God. What version? ESV. ESV. RSV says the same thing. All right. Now, look at the screen. This is one of the Bodmer or Beatty papyri. I'm not sure which. Probably Martin Bodmer papyri. It's very old. It's very early. Uh, if you can see the screen, the last line before the the where it says the gospel according to Luke, on the left-hand side, what is the first word that you can read there? It's four letters. Anybody read that first word? It says readable. First word. Can you see it on the TV back there? <laughs> Jeremy looked really hard on that TV at that first word. On the left hand side at the last line of actual text in the Gospel of Luke. Hierro <laughs> Yeah, Hierro. Hierro. What is Hierro? Temple. Temple, yes. And hiero is what case? It's not hieron, it's hiero. What case? Come on, guys. It's the dative case. It means in the temple. In the temple. See? Now, look at that next word there, Jeremy. Look at your eyeballs on that next word after hiero. Wait, on the next line? No, the same line. Uh, hiero eglo. No, you're, you're seeing that as a gamma, and that's an upsilon. Well, yeah, I told you the upsilon had a tail. Ula, uh, yes. You logon, you logon, from you logeo. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that did it for 
that for sure. <laughs> what does you look on me? You look at oh, okay, come on. Um now we get a eulogy. I want to say it has something to do with It means blessing. Blessing. Alright? And then it's actually a participle, eulogontes, blessing, and then ton theon is the last two words. So the manuscript reads they were continually in the temple blessing God. Which is exactly what Jack's version, the ESV, says. Now, there are some other ancient manuscripts from different times that read they were continually in the temple praising God. But then you get to the ninth century, Brother Steve, when there was a great big revision and they had these earlier manuscripts that they, they saw, well, we've got some manuscripts that say continually in the temple blessing God. And we've got some other manuscripts that say they were continually in the temple praising God. So after this revision in the ninth century, they're thinking, well, we don't want to get this wrong. We don't want to pick the wrong one. And so what did they do? They stuck them both in there and they said they were continually in the temple blessing and praising God. Now, one thing we can be sure of, and this is text critical theory that's really solid. The King James reading of that is not correct. That is not the original reading. It is either, the original reading was either they were continually in the temple blessing God, like this papyrus manuscript says, or it is they were continually in the temple praising God. Now, there's not a hair's breadth worth of difference in the meaning of it. It all means the same thing. But, but this is one example of a variant reading in the New Testament. Okay? Now, this manuscript is a Greek papyrus unsealed manuscript. Very, very old. Not professionally done. This manuscript is probably from the 200s A.D. This manuscript probably a hundred years after John was dead. This is a very old manuscript right here. See right down after after the paragraph break there it says Euangelion Kata Johannes and the Gospel of John in our K Ain Ho Logos. In the beginning was the word. And it goes right on with the with the Gospel of John. Okay, so this is one of the main types of manuscript evidence that's very important in the text of the New Testament. Now, what I've just done with you is what Piaget calls disequilibrium. That is, I've given you a piece of information that, that was a little bit unsettling. And as you listen... You are now in, in the state at which Piaget said that you can learn because you've been unsettled and now you want to resolve that which has unsettled you. So as we study further and you resolve that, we'll learn. See, that's what Piaget's educational theory says. I think he was exactly right. So you see the problem here. Now what we're going to do is, okay, how do we solve this problem? How do we address this problem? as we see these things in uh, the New Testament text. All right, this is another example of a uh, papyrus unsealed manuscript. Now, one of the things you'll find in, in papyrus, uh, Greek papyrus unsealed manuscripts is there is no standard size, there's no standard width or length of column, there's no standard uh, paper size. I mean, it's basically written on everything they could lay their hands on in any form they could do it in. There's no standardization whatever in these early years of copying the text of the New Testament. Why is that? That's because they were hunted. They were illegal. They were meeting down in the basements. They were meeting out by the riversides. They were meeting secretly in people's homes. 
They copy what they could when they could, you know. So there is no standardization to it. Uh, this, these books were illegal even to have. So uh, one of the features you see in, in uh, manuscripts like the one pictured here is what we call nomina sacra contractions. Write this down. N-O-M-I-N-A, nomina, which means name, nomina, and then sacra, S-A-C-R-A, -A, nomina, sacra, contractions. What this means is when they wrote the name of God or when they wrote the name of Christ or when they wrote the name of the Holy Spirit, they did it in an abbreviated form, in a contraction form. Like we'll, we'll write the word do not as don't with a little apostrophe. You know, that's a contraction. So they wrote the divine name sometimes in contractions. Now, look at the third line from the top of this manuscript. Third line from the top in the middle. You see what looks like an I and a C with a line over it. Do you see what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yep. All right. Now that C is not a C. It is a capital S. It is an unsealed S. It's a sigma. The unsealed or capital sigma is written as a capital C. See, this is unsealed script, not the script that you learned in, in Greek 1. But that's an iota and a sigma. That is Jesus, Jesus. It's the first letter of Jesus and the last letter of Jesus with a line drawn over it. See? That's how Jesus is written in some of these old manuscripts. And it's pretty, pretty much that way in all of these old manuscripts. So instead of writing out Jesus, they would write the, the iota, the I, and the S, and then put a line over it as a contra contraction. Look two lines down from that, right below it, and you see a kappa and an epsilon. That's a K and an E. See, kappa and epsilon with a line drawn over it. See, that is the vocative form of the word kurios. For Lord, it's kurie, kurie, Lord in the, in the direct address form. So, Lord, they wrote with just the first letter, the last letter, and a line over the top of it. Count down about one, two, three, four more lines, or five, and you see there over a little bit to the left, P-N-I, P-N-I. That is pneumati, pneumati. That is the word spirit in the dative case, in contracted form. So you have Jesus, Lord, Spirit. Then drop down two more lines, three more lines underneath that, and you have Jesus again. The iota and the sigma with a line over it. Do you see what I'm talking about? Is that a yes or is that a no? Yes. Okay. So these are called nomina sacra contractions or holy name contractions. And they were a, a way that early Christian copyists, for some reason, contracted the names of God and Christ and the Holy Spirit and wrote them in abbreviated form. Now, why? I have no clue. You'll also notice that in this manuscript, if you look at it, uh, there are no um, verse numbers. There are no chapter indications. In fact... There are no spaces between the words. You have to go through here and separate the words. So not only were there no chapters and verses in the original manuscripts of the Greek New Testament, there were not even any spaces between the words. It was written letter upon letter. Okay? And only somebody who knew the language would be able to figure out what was being said and where. And uh, the lines often begin at the middle of a word. So you have to know what you're doing to plow through these. Okay, but this is, this is another example 
like the one we saw before. See, this one was one. This is an early papyrus unseal manuscript. Uh, if you look at that very bottom line down there in the Gospel of John, uh, N, E-N, is the first word there. See, N. And then you have an alpha. See, you'd have a hard time recognizing that as an alpha. N-R-K-A-N, or N-R-K-A-N, Ho Logos, Kai, Ho Logos, Ain, Pros, and that's the end of the line. See? But you kind of have to know where you're headed or you can't get there. Right? So anytime you get hung up on chapters or verses, remember this. There are no chapters and verses. They don't exist. Okay, now, when, when this guy here, Constantine, became the emperor in uh, the 300s after a war, in A.D. 313, which is in the 4th century, the Edict of Milan was signed. And the Edict of Milan legalized Christianity for the first time. See, Christianity was a capital offense. It was a death sentence. It was illegal. It was underground until the Edict of Milan legalized Christianity in 313. Now, after the Edict of Milan legalized Christianity, uh, people could legally now copy the text of the New Testament. And so they began to do it more professionally, using professional scholars and professional scribes to do it. This is where we come into the second category of New Testament manuscripts, which are the parchment unseals. Parchment unseals. See, parchment was a finer, better, uh, more long-lasting writing material, and uh, these were more professionally produced manuscripts from the early time when Christianity was legal. So they began to uh, produce manuscripts like this one. Now, let's let's back up for a minute from, from this. Let's back up for a second to the papyrus unseals. What does unseal mean, um, Brother uh, Jeremy Roberts? It was a... Brother Steve, what does unseal mean? Uh, I agree with Jeremy. Uh, okay. Malik Marsa, what up, man? What does unseal mean? Unseal. Not sure. It's printed. Printed capital letters. Printed capital letters. Correct. Now, can everybody see this little chart right here? This, this is how you will see papyrus manuscripts, papyrus unsealed manuscripts designated in the footnotes of your Greek New Testament. You see where it says P1 right there, P with a little superscript 1? That means papyrus number 1. Under content there it says E. E means the Gospels. So papyrus number 1 is a manuscript of the Gospels it is located in a library in Philadelphia. Okay? And if we come on over one more column here, it dates from the 3rd century, which is the 200s A.D. Okay? Then you have uh, papyrus number 2 is a manuscript of the Gospels. It is located in Florence, Italy. And it dates from the 6th century, which is the 500s. See, some papyri go a little bit later. But then you've got P4 and P5, which both date from the 3rd century. One of them is housed in a library in Paris, one in London. Uh, you keep on going down here in, in all of the list of uh, papyri. We'll zoom in a little bit closer here so you can see some of the symbols a little bit better. But P6, Papyrus 6, contains the Gospels. That's E. 
It's located in Strasbourg, and uh, it dates from the 4th century, the 300s, about the time of Constantine. See? Uh, you go on down here with these listings. P8, see, has Acts. The A means Acts. It's a manuscript of the, Gospel of, or, or the book of Acts. It's located in Berlin, and it dates from the 4th century or the 300s A.D. Brother Jeremy Roberts, yes, sir, sir. In the, uh, in my Greek, it says that eight people means Acts and the Catholic epistles. What, what would those be referring to? The Catholic epistles is like um, First and Second Peter, First and Second, Third John. That means Catholic means general. It means they were sent out over a wide area. They weren't just sent to one place. They were sent out universally all over the place. So that's what Catholic general epistles mean. <clears throat> all right, so A does include the Catholic epistles. The general epistles, you're right. Uh, you can see uh, some of these others here, and you, you can look down through the list. Some of the most famous ones like, let's go down here, focus, P46 is uh, part of the Chester Beatty Papyrus Collection. It's a manuscript of the Pauline Epistles located in, in uh, Dublin, Ireland. It's the Chester Beatty Papyrus, and it dates, notice there the date of this, about 200 A.D., so late second century, early third century, very old manuscript. Okay? You've got some other Chester Beatty papyri there, late third century, late 200s. See? And uh, on and on we can go. All right, now you have another one over here of the Martin Bodmer collection. This is P64, I think it is. I saw we're on the wrong page there. P64, uh, it's a gospel manuscript located in Oxford, about 200 A.D. See some of these, look at how old some of these are. 200, 200, 200, that's Martin Bodmer 2, that's P66. Uh, P72 is, uh, uh, what is that, Catholic Epistles? And it's a uh, Bodmer Papyrus. P74 is a Bodmer Papyrus. So you have 76 collated papyrus manuscripts. And these are the oldest category of New Testament manuscripts. There's not very many of them. But they're very old. They're very important because of the... the the fact that nobody was looking over anybody's shoulder, no political stuff involved here. These were just Christians that were copying the New Testament the best they could. Brother Dan Keel. Hey, Dan, when, when they have the date like a Roman numeral, numeral, is that just the century? That is the century. The third century is the 200s. The fourth century is the 300s. The first century is from... 1 to 99, see, it's the 1 to 100. So you always have to remember to back up one when you're talking about the 2nd century. That's from 100 to 199, see. 3rd century, 100 to 299. Okay? So these are the papyrus uncials, meaning they're written on papyrus. They're <coughs> in those printed capital letters. That's unseal. Printed capital letters. <coughs> okay? Very good. What time is it? Nine five. Okay, we're going to take about a three or four minute break and we'll reassemble. I'll be right back.
Shirts all buttoned up. They're like, ah! <laughs> I keep one in the car just in case. I was like, I got so much stuff going through my head, man. And it's just like, man, if I get mine on the right way, I'm good. I'm not talking about trying to do it. I just got so much stuff going on, man. This is crazy. You don't have anything going on, man. Huh? You don't have anything going on. Still blame it on Jeremy. Excuse me? Yes. I was like, yes, right here. Did it shock you? I just felt like that though. Yeah, I kind of heard a talk of it on your left. It's fried. That's what? It's fried. 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 It's Okay, good book for your library to try to explain stuff to people. This one right here. <coughs> Manuscripts of the Greek Bible. An introduction to paleography. This is a, a, a book that has lots of good pictures of particular 
manuscripts, photographic facsimiles, and you can explain to people when you're trying to show them about, you know, what evidence we have for the text of the New Testament. And it's a very good tool to uh, illustrate some things. Let me see here. The author on that, Dad? Bruce Metzger. Now, see some of the some of the um, papyrus manuscripts of the New Testament that we have are very fragmentary, like this one. Not of a whole lot of use. They just kind of, uh, you know, maybe help us a little bit on one particular passage. This manuscript, however, is P46. This is uh, the Chester Beatty uh, papyrus of the book of Hebrews, P46. Anybody in there got a Greek New Testament or an interlinear? Raise up your paws if you do. That's sad because this is a tech, This is a course on uh, the text, the Greek text, the New Testament. Don't come back to class without a Greek New Testament. Or an, or an interlinear. But if you look at your Greek New Testament there, you that has it, see, this is the first word in Hebrews. Palumeros. Palumeros. Is that the first word in your Greek text in Hebrews, Brother Jeremy Robert? I am almost there. And yes, it is. And see my finger, my fat finger here? <coughs> Kai. And then you have Palutropos. Is that the way your Greek New Testament reads there, Brother Jeremy? <coughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir, it is. So see, Brother Jeremy's Greek New Testament reads exactly like the Chester Beatty Papyrus does, dating from like 200 A.D. So the Testament that he's reading and the Testament that I'm reading with my fat finger up here is the same. The next word is palai, palai, which means old time. And then ho, and then what do you think this right here is where my fat finger is? Jess, look at this where my fat finger is. Oh, you haven't had any Greek yet, have you? Theos. Yes, it's theos because it's theta and sigma with a line drawn over it. What do we call something like this with the first and last letter and the line drawn over it? Nominosacred contraction. Yes, it is. It's a nominosacred contraction. Completely different manuscript than the other one we were looking at, but the same phenomena, see? And then it says, La Lesas. Is that the next word after God you got there, Jeremy? La Lesas. That would be the word. Tois. Patresin. Still with me? Gotcha. All right. See, what we're saying is that the Greek New Testament that Jeremy's reading from back there reads exactly like this papyrus manuscript. I don't know about you, but that's kind of that's kind of cool to me. That here our modern Greek New Testament says the same thing that some obscure Christians New Testament said in the 200s. See what I'm saying? Now, 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 let me say this. This is not a matter of faith. This is a matter of hard scientific evidence. So you could take a skeptic and say, well, you know, how do you know that uh, our New Testament has any accuracy? And you could show them this manuscript, and you can show them the first of the book of Hebrews, and they'd go, whoa, that really is incredible. See, especially if they could decipher what you were doing here. But anybody that had, had any knowledge of Greek could certainly show you that they were the same. Here's another one. This is, uh, this is Gregory Allen P66. It's uh, one of the Bodmer collection. This is one I was showing you earlier. It's a little clearer on this one. You can see the Nomina Sacra contractions and the, the carefully printed 
letters, you know. See, look here. See that, that letter right there? That's a delta. He's just growing a tail a little bit up there. But if you leave him alone a few centuries, he'll grow a real good tail and he'll kind of finagle this bottom part and he'll look like one of your deltas that you learned to, to draw. Uh, this is uh, early 3rd century uh, Gospel of uh, Luke. Now, this one is interesting to me because see if you can figure out what what uh, word that is right there. Let me zero in a little bit more. Let's get in there closer. Right there. It's hard to read unsealed script if you're not used to it. Moi QA. Moi QA. It comes from the word moi QO, which means what? Anybody? Uh, yeah, no idea. It means to commit adultery. To commit adultery. It says, uh, and if she marries another man, she commits adultery. This is Luke 16, verse 18. And then it says, there was an anthropos, a certain anthropos plusios, a certain rich man who was clothed in fine linen. This is Luke 16, 19. This is the parable or the story of the rich man and Lazarus right there. And it's interesting that there's a little break right there between the sayings and the story of the rich man and Lazarus. But this is from Luke chapter 16. Now Luke didn't know, as you can see here, when Luke wrote it and the people copied it, he didn't know that this was chapter 16 because it really wasn't chapter 16 because there was no <coughs> such thing as 16. But this is the part that we later came to call Luke chapter 16, verses 18 and 19. But it's interesting to me that here's this old 3rd century manuscript and it says the same thing that my Bible says in Luke 16, verses 18 and 19. You see that letter right there with the circle with the line down through it? What letter is that? Yeah, sp speak louder like men. Five? Yes. And now what do you think that one right next to it is? Upsilon? Yes, that's an upsilon. What's that next one? Uh, rho. Rho. What's that next one? Delta. Alpha. Yeah, that's an alpha. alpha. And the next one? New. That's a new. That's correct. You can see the word Kai there next to it. So <clears throat> anyway, that's this is another example. Now let me widen out and show you the difference in, in even the paper size here, the papyrus size. You see this this kind of long drawn out, long elongated piece of papyrus. This is a third century manuscript. Then look at how different that is from this squared off short one. And from this one that's a bigger piece of squared off stuff. And there's no standardization at all to it. This is somebody's paper sack they wrote on or something. I don't know. You know, it's, it's like there's no standardization to line size, paper size, column size, anything. The only thing similar is the way that they made their letters. See, this is another one of those uh, elongated things. In fact, this manuscript, which dates from the early 3rd century, the early 200s, this is an Old Testament Greek manuscript. It's a Septuagint manuscript from the book of Ezekiel. And uh, let me show you one thing here that I think you'll find interesting. It's an Old Testament manuscript. What word is this word right here? Let me go in a little further. Yeah. So it's it's the word what? 
God, right? Referring to the God of the Old Testament. And what is this one right here? Can you focus it down? Huh? Can you focus it Oh, I'm sorry. What's the one right here? Curion. Not Curion, but what's the second letter? Curios. Curios. See, that's the that's a capital S. Curios or Lord. So this is God and this is Lord, and those are both nomen sacra contractions. Do you see how do you see how neat and printed and capital these letters are separate? See? There's the word the beginning, arcane, right there. Uh, but uh, this is part of the book of Ezekiel. It's a Septuagint manuscript from the 200s. Here's a couple of more uh, early uh, papyrus manuscripts. Uh, the handwriting is, is different, but it's still the same printed type Greek unsealed script. You know, very non-standard. All of them are different. Uh, let me see if I can get this over this way to see this other one. This one I'm having a hard time getting on the page there. But here, he, he's got a lot of examples of these. Now this one, you see how different the character of this manuscript is? See, this manuscript is uh, manuscript Vaticanus, Codex Vaticanus from the 4th century. This is a parchment un unsealed. This is one that was done after Christianity was legalized. This is one of the m nice professional manuscripts that were done after Constantine said that it was okay to be a Christian. In the Edict of Milan in 313. <clears throat> but Jeremy, look at here. See that first letter is a P. Palumeros Chi. Palutropos, Palai, Potheos, Lalesas, Tois Patresin. What book is this? Hebrews. This is the very same first chapter of Hebrews that I showed you over on Chester Beatty Papyrus a couple hundred years earlier, and it reads exactly the same way as Chester Beatty. See what I'm saying? I'm talking but a beam, but a boom. I mean, you, you you can just say this is just hard scientific evidence for the text of the New Testament that goes way way back. Now this manuscript is from the 300s. All right, so 300 to 1300 is a thousand years. 1300 to uh, uh, 2011 is what? 700 more years. So we're 1,700 years down the road from this, and we've got the same text. <clears throat> so when somebody says, now, how can you possibly know that when the New Testament was written 2,000 years ago, that we really have what they wrote back then? And we'll say, well, here's one from 1,700 years ago, and it says the same thing. And then you back up to uh, the Chester Bailey Papyrus, you know, that we found earlier, P46. And you say, now here's one from 1,900 years ago or 1,850 years ago, and it says the same thing. So, I mean, doesn't this help you, help you out a little bit here? Sure does. Sure does. So, so, in the New Testament, see, we have 5,300 and some odd actual Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. The sheer volume of scientific evidence that we have for the text of the New Testament <clears throat> blows away uh, what we've got from uh, the Old Testament uh, uh, in, as far as scientific evidence. And we can get down to crunching the computers and the everything and literally get down to a 99.99 something percent degree of absolute certainty for the text of the New Testament. I mean, it's not even a matter of faith. It's a matter of scientific certainty that we have the text of the New Testament. And we're going to talk about variant readings 
and where those variant readings uh, figure into all this. But these are called Greek unseal manuscripts, most of which, except for that one that I showed you, are um, papyrus unseal manuscripts. <clears throat> okay? So what's different? If somebody asks you, okay, you've got the papyrus unseals and the parchment unseals, What's basically the difference in those two types of uh, manuscripts? Brother Anthony, what would you say? The papyrus were written earlier and were not as uniform because they were Christianity was illegal, so they were written by just anybody in whatever form they could. And the parchments were after Christianity was legalized. They were more professionally produced. That's what I'm talking about right there. Now, there's overlap in the dates of the papyri and the parchment unseals because they still kept writing on some papyrus manuscripts after Christianity was was uh, legalized and some professional manuscripts were being produced too. So from like the 4th century to the 7th century, you have both papyrus and parchment unseals. See? So you kind of overlap there, but the the earlier category is the parchment unseals. Okay. <clears throat> now let's go back to our other camera here. Just a minute. Now these are Greek versions of the of the uh, New Testament, right, Jess? No. No. They're Greek manuscripts. Why are they not Greek versions? Because version is a translation from the original language to another language, but Greek is the original language. That is correct. That is correct, Amundo. Okay. So we talked about the papyrus unseals, and there's good old Constantine. Constantine is a piece of work because Constantine was a pagan. He was superstitious. He loved to sin. He loved all kinds of immorality. He told the Christians that, you know, he was he was sympathetic to them. He believed that they helped that Christ helped get him his victory, uh, get him on the emperor's throne. But he really liked to sin, and so he really didn't want to become a Christian because if he did, he'd have to quit sinning, and he didn't want to. He loved to sin. And so he waited evidently until his deathbed to make some kind of a, maybe they splashed a little water on him or something, but he was he was not really a Christian. He was a sympathizer with Christians, but he was a sinful pagan. But he legalized Christianity and made it legal for them to build buildings and do all kinds of other things which never was legal before. Which brought us to the period of these uh, parchment unseal manuscripts, professionally produced unseal manuscripts, like Codex Vaticanus. <clears throat> Vaticanus is usually dated like 4th century, uh, which is the 300s. Uh, in, in the early uh, uh, text critical studies of people like uh, Tischendorf and uh, 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 Westcott Court and, and other people like that, if you read Metzger's text of the New Testament, uh, manuscripts like this that they discovered that went way back to the 4th century were very, very important in their view and their understanding of the text of the New Testament. Uh, there were there are quite a few uh, parchment unseals that are listed in the New Testament, and uh, this is one of them. Uh, there's a couple of other real famous ones. There's manuscript Sinaiticus. <clears throat> Sinaiticus was found at... Uh, uh, the monastery of Mount Sinai or Mount uh, St. Catherine on Mount Sinai and I'll tell you the story of that in a little bit and there was Alexandrinus but just to kind of set the stage see let's 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 say that you know Christianity was legalized okay yay Ra that was 313 between 313 and 476 though the Roman Empire kind of crumbled around people's ears. And by 476, all these barbarians were hacking people's heads off everywhere. And the Roman army was destroyed. 
if you've seen the movie Gladiator with uh, Russell Crowe and all those all those long-haired blonde dudes coming out of the woods, you know, that's who kind of ran over the the Roman Empire. That was wintertime in that movie, and in summertime they were all naked and blonde and painted, but uh, they were the same group of people, and uh, they destroyed the government, they destroyed destroyed the social infrastructure, they destroyed education, they they. Uh, turned the Roman Empire into a disaster area where there was no central government, there was no central education, everything was just a constant war. It was a terrible situation. And the Dark Ages ensued. See? And during the Dark Ages, which lasted from about 476 until way into the medieval periods, let's say the 1200s, there was almost no education, there was very little centralized power, everybody was warring with everybody else, disease, famine, death. Uh, The church was the only thing that was halfway consistent, and it was the church, and in in particular monasteries, that became uh, responsible for keeping uh, the the Bible text preserved during that time. Um, Now, That's when you have a lot of your parchment unseals that were produced, professionally produced by church-trained scribes in the early era of Catholicism. Uh, Let me go back to another camera here. I want to show you how we deal with, um, (coughs) excuse me, with um, parchment unseals in the textual apparatus at the footnote of your Greek text. See, the papyrus unseals are P with a little superscript, like P1, P2, P66, etc., like you see there. <clears throat> but when we come down to the parchment unseals, we have a different way of, of uh, describing them. If you look in the footnote of your Greek New Testament, which I hope and pray that you will bring with you next time to class, You'll see this symbol here, this Hebrew Aleph. That is manuscript 01. And it contains E-A-P-R. In other words, it contains the Gospels, Acts, the Catholic Epistles, the Pauline Epistles, and the Book of Revelation. It's located in London. That is manuscript Sinaiticus, found by Tischendorf at the Monastery of St. Catherine on Mount Sinai. And it dates from the 300s, the 4th century. See, this is one of the best and most famous uh, parchment unseal manuscripts. Now, some of the parchment unsealed manuscripts, if you look on the left-hand side over there, they are designated with capital letters. They're designated with capital letters. But they are also designated with a number. And sometimes, <clears throat> especially when it deals with later unseals, they're only designated with a number. So you'll have uh, a part, you'll have a, like a capital A or a capital B or a capital C in the footnote. You know when you see a capital letter that that is a parchment unseal. That is a printed manuscript. But it's written on parchment, so it's later than the 4th century. It's 4th century and later. Okay? A, B, C. Let me give you an example here from a footnote. Let's zero in on this particular footnote. This is a footnote on uh, Matthew (coughs) chapter chapter 27, verse 49. And this is just part of the footnote on the variant reading. And see, it says here, it's got a B reading, which means they're pretty sure that this is the way it ought to read. And then these are the manuscripts that support that reading. Okay, all of these capital letters here are manuscripts that designate, these are parchment unsealed manuscripts. How do you know? Because they're designated by capital letters. Then you have this one, which is also a parchment unsealed, because if you have just a number, Nothing but a number uh, with a zero. Uh, those numbers with a zero are also parchment unsealed manuscripts. So you can tell in your footnote 
that you have parchment unseals if they're capital letters or numbers with a zero. Okay, we'll explain the rest of this stuff later. Okay? <clears throat> so you can tell, for example, down in this other this other reading. See, these are parchment unseals right here. These capital letters. That's Sinaiticus, that's Vaticanus, that's Ephraimi Rescriptus. You know, there's different ones, and if you do any work in this area, you come to learn what those are and what those stand for. And, and see, what does that mean? Well, see, if I can see that that particular reading is supported by this manuscript from the 4th century, found by Titian Dorf at Mount Sinai. That's Codex Vaticanus from the 4th century. So I know exactly what it is that supports that reading. All right, so let me go back to the front of this where the, the key is. See, like in, in the other case, uh, you've got what the manuscript is called, what it contains. Uh, it's located in Paris. It's called Ephraimi Rescriptus. Because this is this is what's called a palimpsest manuscript, which means that it was it was uh, something else had been written on this piece of parchment, and they scraped it off, and they wrote this Greek manuscript over top of it, or the other way around. It was written underneath it, or written over top of it. But that's what's called a palimpsest manuscript. You don't have to worry about that. That's just FYI for no reason at all. <clears throat> So you have uh, all of the capital um, letters of the alphabet plus capital Greek letters that refer to these unseal parchment manuscripts. Then there are some other unseal manuscripts that are for one reason or another not as important, and they're just listed by a number with a zero in front of it. But these are all uh, parchment unseal manuscripts. Some of these date from 7th, 8th, 9th century, 10th century, see, like this. They're, they're, they're listed with just a zero and a number. <clears throat> now, one of the things you know, and this is another fact you need to write down, one of the things you know about any parchment unsealed manuscript, they all date from before the 9th century, 9th century or before. So see, the papyrus unseals date from real early in that period where Christianity was illegal. The parchment unseals date from like the 4th through the 9th century. There's still some very good evidence. <clears throat> but there's fewer of them because they're older, see. The older, the further back you go, the fewer of them there are. Does that make sense? I mean, is it easier to, do, to survive a thousand years or two thousand years? You know, the further back in time you go, the fewer of those very old manuscripts you're going to have. That just makes sense. See? The later in time you go, the more manuscripts you're going to have because the chances of survival are so much more. See with me? It's just easier for books to survive a couple of hundred years than it is for them to survive a couple of thousand years. Is that a no-brainer or not? Yep, that's a no-brainer. Yeah, that's a no-brainer. <clears throat> so uh, some, some people will say stuff like this. They will say, there are many more manuscripts that support this reading in the King James Bible. I think there are manuscripts that support this reading in the New American Standard Bible. And to an uninitiated person, that sounds really good, see? But the thing that's wrong with that is the many more manuscripts that support the reading in the King James Bible are late, late, late in date. And the very few manuscripts that support the other reading are very old and very early in date. See what I'm saying? Okay, so, so just because there's more doesn't necessarily mean better. 
Okay, it depends on a lot of different things, and we're going to talk about what those things are as we go along a little bit further in our in our class. <clears throat> now, I promise you that when you get done with all of this, you'll be glad we studied it. Some people just want to remain blissfully ignorant. They just don't want to know any of this stuff. Because if they don't know any of this stuff, they won't have to think about this stuff. The problem with that in our information age, especially with a lot of educated young people, is there will be people you'll confront in your ministry that will come from denominational schools and backgrounds, and they will have been exposed to some of this stuff from a different perspective. And they'll come to you and they'll ask you, well, what about this and so? And even though you don't want to think about it, you will be much better served if you have already thought about it. See what I'm saying? So ignorance is not bliss. If you're going to preach the word in the modern age, you need to know something about this subject. And that's why we're having this conversation. See how we got the Bible. All right, so dark ages, killing, raping, pillaging, plague, bubonic plague... Everybody trying to survive, nastiness, disease, rats, you know. And a few people that were trying to preserve the text of the Bible. <clears throat> it was places like this, out in the middle of nowhere, in the Sinai Peninsula, in an enclosure called the Monastery of St. Catherine, when a whole world all around it was, was killing each other, places like this one had quietness and peace, and they studied Greek manuscripts and copied Greek manuscripts. <coughs> In the 1800s, there was a young man who was um, a German scholar, <coughs> or a Prussian, I'm not sure what his exact background was, but von Tischendorf, his name was Constantine von Tischendorf, and Tischendorf was interested in the study of the Greek text of the Bible, and he was trying to go all over the world in different monasteries and places where he thought there might be old copies, and visit those places and try to find actual evidence for the early text of the New Testament. Tischendorf uh, made one of the first textual apparatuses of the Greek New Testament where he actually showed different readings and what manuscripts supported them and so forth. But on several different occasions, uh, Tischendorf had the occasion to visit the monastery of St. Catherine and Mount Sinai, and they had some beautiful manuscripts. Uh, you know, some of these late medieval uh, parchment seals and things like that. <clears throat> On one occasion, he was visiting the mon monastery, and he noticed an old basket of rotten-looking pieces of paper, and the monks were using those to start their fires with as kindling, to stoke their fires. And he looked down at what was in the basket, and he saw that they were parchment uh, sheets of uh, parchment with Greek lettering on them. And he said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, what in the world is that? You know, Well, they were old Bibles and stuff that they had worn out, and they were, you know, but those things went way back. And so as he visited, uh, the uh, abbot of the monastery finally began to trust him, and he said, well, that's nothing. He said, wait till you see what I've got in this closet back here. And so out of an inner closet, the abbot of this monastery pulls out this, this codex that, uh, you know, von Tischendorf just melted into jelly when he saw it. He looked at the paleography of the manuscript and immediately realized that there was something extremely rare right here. And it turned out to be manuscript Sinaiticus, a codex of the New Testament dating from the 300s, you know. It was an incredible find. And all during the Dark Ages, it had been sitting there inside those walls when everything else outside was being burned and destroyed, and it had been preserved all those years, sitting in that monastery. Well, that story was replicated 
numerous times in different locations around the world when other Greek manuscripts were found in other monasteries throughout uh, Eastern and Western Europe and the Middle East. Uh, guys like this one, who were monks of one stripe or another, who uh, uh, followed the Benedictine rule and, and worked on manuscripts and so forth, they were responsible for copying and transmitting uh, the text of the New Testament in various faraway places that were protected uh, from the ravages of the outside world. Um, <clears throat> now, I want to go to a different file here real quickly. Try to explain a little bit of that to you. File open. Slide sorter. Ching. Come on, I know it's in here. Yes, it is. Okay. Slide show. Now let's see if we can get our PowerPoint back. Wait for it. Oh, wait for it. Got it? <clears throat> All right. The monastic movement, as we know it, uh, started in the 200s or before. Uh, it was a very early uh, movement. The beginnings of monasticism were in uh, the deserts of Egypt. Uh, two individuals are famous in this. Number one is a man named Antony. Uh, in the, you have in your library there, a, a, uh, in the Antonicene Fathers, the writings of Athanasius, Athanasius of Alexandria. He was a bishop of Alexandria in the 300s. Anyway, under Athanasius, you will find the life of Antony. The life of Antony. <clears throat> Antony was a guy that, uh, you know, he was, he was listening to the preachers preach. Uh, and they were preaching on the Gospels. And he listened to them preach on the rich young ruler. And uh, the rich young ruler was told, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor and you shall have treasure in heaven. And uh, he was living at a time when, when uh, austerity was kind of the general mood of, of how you were really religious. And Anthony, his parents had died. He had a sister, and he was responsible for her. But he just went and sold everything he had. And he gave a little to, to help his sister be supported in, in some place for women. And he just went out into the desert and went into a cave and started trying to live a solitary, contemplative life where he just prayed and studied the Word, and he was trying to get away from all the temptations of the flesh and everything. And the story of the life of Antony became very, very popular reading as to how the, that Antony was a leader of kind of a movement in the ancient church where people were going to get extreme on fighting the temptations of the flesh, and totally dedicate themselves to spiritual things, totally remove themselves from the world of uh, temptation. And Anthony started a movement which was called uh, Anchorites. Anchorites. <clears throat> A-N-C-H-O-R-I-T-E-S. Anchorites. And uh, another way of putting this was hermit monks. Hermit monks. <clears throat> Meaning these guys were recluses. They got away from everybody. They lived solo. See, all by themselves out here somewhere. 
So Anthony did this, and he writes how Satan tempted him and how, you know, the devil would attack him, and he, he, he dreamed of dancing girls, you know, and his lusts would overcome him, and he was trying to fight his lusts, and so he would throw himself on a thorn bush to fight his lust. Now, I recommend that to you all. If you ever get in a lustful mood and you want to fight your lust, throw yourself on a thorn bush. That will cure you in a heartbeat, believe me. That that will take care of your problem right then. That's, that's but, better than tearing your eye out. Yeah, that's about, yeah, tearing your eye out, sort of. But he was of that, that uh, idea. They didn't believe in wearing uh, soft clothes that would feel good on your body. They would wear these real scratchy, gunny sack kind of material that would scratch your flesh and it wouldn't be comfortable because they felt like that would indulge your flesh. Uh, they wouldn't sleep on a soft bed because that would be molly coddling your body, you know. They'd sleep on the hard ground because you wanted to suppress the body and in engage the spirit, you know. They would fast. They would only eat vegetables and only drink water. They'd get real skinny, you know. <clears throat> they were They were all... You know, their hair flying and all this kind of stuff. And Anthony became like he was the man as far as this was concerned. Now, this was not just Anthony that did this. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> there were other men that had gone out into the desert. This was kind of a popular fad. And so what Anthony would do, which we could learn a lot from, there was one man over here, for example, in a cave a couple of miles away that <coughs> maybe was really, really good at prayer. I mean, he was just a prayer warrior. And so Anthony would go visit him and try to learn from him how to really pray. Then there was another man over here, maybe a couple of miles over the next hill, living by himself. And he was really a, a man of the Word of God. And he was really good in the Scriptures and laying up the Word in his heart. And so Anthony would go learn from him. <clears throat> there was another man over here, maybe that lived by himself, and, and he had mastered his tongue. He was very quiet. He never never spoke. And Anthony wanted to learn about holding his tongue from him. So he kind of went to these different ones, learned humility from this one, and learned kindness from that one, and you know learned different things from different ones, and tried to to uh, develop all the possible spiritual graces, spiritual disciplines that he possibly could. See, so this was all about complete denial of the flesh and completely concentrating on spiritual things. This was the beginning of monasticism, see, the withdrawal from society. <clears throat> now, the other famous guy, <clears throat> excuse me, that did this was a guy by the name of Pacomius. Pacomius was the champion of a different kind of monk. They were called the Kenobites, Kenobites, which is spelled uh, C or a K, depending on which one you want. Uh, K-E-N-O-B-I-T-E-S, Kenobites, Kenobites. And the Kenobites were people that instead of going out in the desert all by themselves, tended to go in groups. Uh, they tended to go as a little community of people out into the desert somewhere. And they would, they would grow their own food and they would be their own self-sufficient little commune, you know. <clears throat> and they would withdraw uh, the Essene Jews of Qumran were more like the Kenobites, you know. They would make a little community out in the desert somewhere. Well, this really took off. And if you read the writings of the fathers in the 2nd, 3rd, 4th century, you find a lot of people that decided they would take celibacy as their, their way of life. Maybe they'd been divorced and they couldn't scripturally remarry. So they would be celibate and they would go to the spiritual life and they would withdraw into some community and uh, this was the way they did. <clears throat> they, uh, they would do physical labor and pray. Anyway, when I get back, I'll tell you more about this and then how this figures in with the preserving of the manuscript tradition. Hey, Jack, can you spell that? Can I buy it word again? K-E-N-O-B-I-T-E. Adios, amigos. <laughs>